Welcome uh, Yin and whoever is going to watch this to this conversation uh, where I suspect we're going to be talking about perhaps decolonizing the strategies of future. Um, and this is uh, offered in the container of rewarding, uh, where, which is this gathering that is going to happen at the end of May. And I'm really happy that you're here, Yin, and I'm just gonna introduce you in the way that I have been um, knowing the little bit I know from you. And I attended a workshop, uh, I think, beginning of the year or end of last year, which was about indigenous perspectives on decolonizing the, for me, it was more decolonizing everything, but I still have the title somewhere. Ah, the colonial futures. The colonial futures, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Just, just the title really pulled me in because one of the things that we are struggling with in organizing this um, gathering and thinking about assemblies like global assemblies and, and, and things like that is how do we, how do we stop bringing our own colonized ways of dealing with the problems that we have and colonized ways of bringing strategies to solve those problems. So when I saw the title, I was like, oh, I need to be there uh, with this conference and, and, and with these ideas, with this project in mind. But in the end, I was just, it was so personal. So everything, the, the workshop was really um, going very deep into my own history and my own indigenosity which I'm really struggling to to come to terms with and, and to find myself because of my my background and being kind of a mixture of, of different things and moving around so it was it was the questions I just realized it's not you know they they are relevant for every person um, regardless of how indigenous we are and 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 that shaking of the concept as well I think is very important so that that's how I got to know from you and um, I've read some of the things that you've written. Um, so I know you're a professor in uh, issues of race and, and social health. I think I could uh, say it like that, but I would much rather have you introduce yourself in the sense of telling whatever you feel that in this moment is relevant for how, how your journey has been to this moment in time. So welcome again. Yes. Thank you, Tito. Uh, yeah, so uh, for me, um, I'm a Aboriginal man uh, from the Wakaya mob uh, in the north of Australia. And uh, yeah, I live in a country that's very colonial. And um, I guess I've been struggling to come to an understanding of what that means for the, you know, the several decades that I've lived. And uh, my, my work really has for a long time focused on, on racism and how we can understand and address racism. But more recently, I've tried to sort of delve deeper and, and come to a more fundamental understanding of what underpins the various forms of oppression that mm -hmm. seem to proliferate in our in our societies around the world. And that's what brought me to trying to um, trying to understand colonialism and and what is the nature of that and how could we become decolonial in our in our own lives and influence others to do that and perhaps change the perhaps change how the future might unfold. Yeah, so that's my interest and I've been uh, from a personal perspective I've I've tried to change the way I've lived and and recently I I moved to an intentional community uh, 
near Melbourne in Australia, because I'm very much um, of the view that we need to become much more local and we need to become much more communal. And we need to really as a way to um, balance out the very extreme individualism and competitiveness of our society. So I'm looking for cooperative, authentic, connected, localized ways of existing in the world. And there's many examples of how to do that. And I'm, I've just, in the last few years, tried to engage more personally with those. Yeah. Mm, that, that's one thing that I find also quite interesting is your personal um, mixing of the academic part of your life and, and you know, all the facts and numbers and, and, and study of kind of things that are perhaps coming from a more linear way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. something that I also experienced in your workshop and how, how then observing those truths from a more heart-centered, relation-centered uh, way. So kind of embodying this, this linear thinking in a non-linear way. So is that, uh, is, is that kind of informing the way that you can see those two, perhaps it's not two different things, but those two ways of looking at truth and reality? Is, is there, mm, yeah. Are you kind of managing to merge them in some way? I'm trying. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting journey. I think there is a lot of, uh, as you say, there's a lot of rationality, a lot of uh, ideas of singular truth, a lot of um, trying to capture capturing the nature of reality in in academic work, even if it's qualitative, where it doesn't have to be about numbers, but it's still a, a, a sense of um, <clears throat> capturing and documenting, writing down, and uh, kind of uh, knowledge as a as an object, as a commodity mm. that can be mm. created and traded and kind of locked away in in vaults of of university libraries. And it's a very uh, different approach to my take on knowledge as a a continual process of unfolding between between beings in the world. You know, knowledge is something that exists between. Uh, parts of the universe as a really a way of of relating to each other and so yeah it's it's quite I think it's it should be quite embodied uh, quite, quite uh, personal quite subjective um, and that's yeah moving against the grain I, I would say of most of the people I work with uh, for some reason, people keep inviting me to present at their forums and they seem to be very perplexed by the end of them as to what I've actually been talking about. Mm. <laughs> I told someone uh, at a forum yesterday that research should most definitely not be led by researchers. Wow. <laughs> we are there as, uh, as kind of uh, mentors and and um, co-liberators, I like this word, co-liberators, uh, we, we sort of assist people who have something they want to find out more about. But mm. I just think that research should be much more led by the needs and desires of communities and so that we should be, you know, not up front but coming behind and, and sort of, you know, supporting, really, mm. yeah. Well, that, that's, <laughs> that sounds quite challenging to a lot of the academic structures mm. yeah it is i can't help but see the connection of that with with uh, systems in general as well and how so that what you mm. say about the needs of the communities and the needs of people leading their research instead of my understanding mm. of academia is very much like what can we do as, as a, what are what is the technology there and with that kind of leading the research and, and more of abstract questions as well but imagining the needs actually leading not only research but politics and economics 
sounds very natural yes. and like you say it sounds like it goes very much against the grain as well well i think it does because the problem is one of the predicaments at least that we're in is is this um this this hierarchy this hierarchies that have um the many hierarchies that have taken over the world you know and so that sense that uh that sense that individuals and communities and collectives should be involved should um make decisions uh about things that affect their life you know they should be mm. involved in decisions to the same extent that that decision is going to impact on them and the, to the same the sort of cor corollary of that is that of course people who are not going to be affected by a decision shouldn't be making it and that's precisely mm. the opposite of how how hierarchies work in our society how institutions work how nation states work we've kind of given over and I do think that it is a it is a choice, implicit perhaps, but we've given over control of our lives to select few individuals who, yeah, by the nature of power, uh, are not very good at wielding it. I do, I do I think that I do agree with the adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I think that we in everyday lives of course by the the, the the small actions that we take we um we we continue to act as if these systems are the only way mm. that life can be organized and they're not no no they're not in, and is there a so you you say but part part of it is perhaps a choice that we're giving away the the power to decide about our own lives. Mm. I have the sense in, in in my experience in in some countries that I lived is that people sometimes are not even willing to to have that responsibility and it's sold perhaps it's sold to us or we see it in a way that it's it's a it's a it's an extra work that we don't want to do. We want to outsource that because of the responsibility mm. or the time that we have to invest. Yeah. Is there a way you yeah. think, do you have experience in, 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 in your local community, for instance, of doing it differently where people actually come together to take their own decisions? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that happens in my community. Yeah, we have... Uh... We have a range of different committees with different responsibilities uh, that people can, uh, well, anyone could turn up to any committee meeting and be part of decision-making. We have a monthly meeting of the whole community where more decisions are made. There's, you know, there's delegation, there's structure. It's not all completely flat and, and open and there's decision-making processes. But the point is that, not that there's no rules, but the rules... Mm -hmm are made mm. without rulers. There's no rulers. There's rules that are made by the people who abide by the rules and they can change the rules as well. Mm. I, do, I do think that we are sold this idea that just leave that to us. You know, we're politicians. We can handle that for you. It's too much. It's too complicated. Uh, you know, um, for example, it reminds me of uh, the kind of talk from the financial markets around the... Uh, the last crash and uh, ongoing from then is this idea that um, um, collateral, collateralized debt obligations and other financial tools, they're just, they're too complicated for <laughs> you to understand. You can't understand. So don't even try and, 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 and get a sense of what's happening in the world because it's too complex for you to understand. I think that um, neoliberal capitalist colonial systems, they, they do, they do quite, um, effectively uh keep people busy yeah with a lot of uh meaningless a lot of a lot of meaningless bullshit jobs in most cases and so we don't have time or energy or attention to devote to how our societies actually operate whether that's mm -hmm. economics or politics or social systems but you know the evidence from around the world uh, from for example things like 
uh, participatory budgeting, uh, which has thousands of examples around the world, is that people are, of course, quite good at understanding their own lives and their own contexts and, and quite able and willing to put in their time and the energy and the focus to make decisions. And things happen, uh, you know, that are considered impossible by economists. For example, in some places where, where participatory budgeting has been done by local communities, they've voted to increase taxes that they pay. Amazing. Just impossible under rationalist economic frameworks. But, mm. of course, people know that they are in charge of how their money is spent, so they're happy to pay more tax. Mm. And how, how is then growth uh, part of that, economic growth? Yes, economic growth. Yeah, economic growth is kind of... Uh, It's a byproduct, really, of of these systems of these hierarchical systems and these systems of accumulation. So the the whole point of modernity is to really it's meant to provide uh, quite a quite a lot of resources to certain segments of you know upper and middle class and ruling class segments of society and. Uh, There's growth in economics. There's also growth in, in human populations that are, mm. are, are part of the system too. And, and uh, for most of human history, people haven't been very interested in, in increasing the numbers of people in their village. They, they were pretty happy with a stable population. But nation states constantly at war with each other. They need people. They need, oh, we need to spread out. We need to take over this continent. We need to keep other people out. And... and uh, Yeah, the promise, the growth is part of that promise of 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 progress, uh, of expansion, of accumulation. Otherwise, because of the nature of our systems, uh, the children of even middle class or upper middle class people um, may not have as much of an opportunity to acquire the wealth that their parents have. You know, the mm. sort of statistics that you see these days are things like in the 1970s, uh, children were 80% more likely to, to earn more than their parents over their lifetime. Mm. And now it's that number is dropping quite fast. It's down to something like less than a little under 50% chance that you'll do as well as your parents did in terms of mm. monetary accumulation. And that's just goes to show that, you know, infinite growth on the finite planet is not possible and, you know, it's, it's catching up with us. Somehow it brings yeah. me hope to actually hear that that we, we are not necessarily going to earn more than our parents. For me, that, that, yeah. that would be a sign of progress in some way. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, somehow um, this might sound very evident to you, but I, I just said... So growth actually is at the core of colonialism because we need that expansion that that's kind of the the what is feeding that and but also colonialism is feeding that so there seems to be like a um feedback loop or or something that is actually perpetually eroding the system um Is there a way of mm. coming at it in, in, in some way or, or what is, is there, do we need to actually even deal with it or, or yeah, how, how do we stop that <laughs> and we have to stop? It? Yeah, there are certainly are a number of, uh, of positive feedback loops in, in modern systems. Yeah, it's, it's not quite um, as... There's no, uh, there's no sort of uh, grand master plan that someone's running from their, mm. their, uh, their lair in the, in within a mountain, mountainous volcano range or something. That's not how it works. No, it's that things just reinforce each other. And this is the problem with with modernity is that it is a, it's quite a powerful 
sort of compelling system in terms of its reinforcements. Once you get into it, it becomes difficult to get out of it. And uh, it's a bit like, I mean, people have used this metaphor, but it's a bit like cancer, really. Mm. It's uh, hard to stop uh, until it has essentially killed the host that it lives in. And mm. I think that uh, it, you can you can stretch the metaphor a little bit too far, but we we can we can divest, we can disinvest, we can uh, starve colonial systems by not participating in them. Mm. I think that's probably one of the best approaches. Of course, there will be consequences of that. You know, when people refuse to play the game of colonial capitalism, the powers that be will react badly to that. They'll react violently to that. But they are dependent on humans in the end. They are dependent on the masses. They can't run the show by themselves, uh, the puppet show uh, that they're holding the strings for. But I don't think, in more generally, I don't, I, just, I don't think that it really is up to us in a strong sense to change the world. I think one of our most important things is to do things in a way that's that's different to the colonial mindset mm. and so we need to be careful not to apply force to solve problems because force is the way of uh, capitalist colonial systems you will do this you can you can wage a war on colonialism but then you'll just become a, a stronger form of colonialism in itself so it's not about war it's not about changing anything. It's really what we, I think we need to be doing is opening our beings, being receptive to the transformative potential of the world. So we need to be changed by the world. That's what we're really here to do, to get deeply in touch with what is right now in the world and feel the trauma and then sense into that trauma, respond to that trauma, anticipate what may happen from our response and continue to feel ourselves changing through that process. So it's a matter of tuning in. It's not a matter of forcing any sort of change. It's about tuning in more deeply to the, the always many possibilities of where things may unfurl. Thank you. This is just beautiful. Um, yeah, do you have the sense that this is happening already? That there is there mm. a... Uh, that's that's the feeling I have from from where I am and 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 yeah, already just listening to what you just said has just makes me feel that this is happening. Um, and I guess a lot of us at the moment we are we are kind of in this possibly still quite colonial frame of the urgency of the crisis that we are confronted with and it's not one there's so many crises at the moment um, what's happening with the environment what is happening with the society the polarization the violence all that um, mm. so it's that what I hear or what I feel when you say that is that we need that spaciousness to actually sit with what is and what was and then just hear mm. and absorb what 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 the world is telling us and at the same time, I have, I have that sense of, oh my God, there's this thing coming behind me that it's not gonna give me the time. So I sense like a tension between, we need the pause mm. and, the, and, and the calm. And there is this machine that is trying to prevent us from doing that. It's exactly <laughs> it. There is, the, there is a machine, yeah, the, the machine of death, the machine of oblivion that is capitalism. Is mm. where it, it's it's all, all around us. We're part of the we're part of the cogs of those of that machine, and we're one of the cogs of that machine. And 
Yeah, there is a there is a sense of urgency that people have, but I think that it's more helpful to let go of that sense of urgency and really take the time to reflect mm. before you act, and then reflect and act again, and just keep going in that cycle, uh, sensing, attuning, letting go kind of falling apart in a way and, and becoming more expansive, as you said. There's a sense of expansiveness, of spaciousness that we need to create for ourselves. We need to at least strive for something like that mm. so that we can really act in a way that's ethical, in a way that's from the right process, yeah. The problem is that the whole thing with capitalism and colonialism is this idea that of urgency, it's everywhere, you know, the sense of we must have more resources, we must have better technology, we must have more compliant citizenry, we need to win this war against whatever it is, drugs, poverty, violence, ourselves. We war on ourselves, you know, in this, in this self-development age. And really, that's the problem. And, and you can't, you know, you can't dismantle, as Audrey Lord said, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Mm. Actually, you can. You can dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, but in wielding the tools, you become the master yourself. And so what I'm suggesting, and a lot of other people have suggested this too, is that we need to let go of urgency and, and not so much run ahead of the machine constantly on a sort of treadmill, but look around, just look around away from the highway, look to the, the fields that aren't on the highway and look, where could we? It may be quite simple to simply step aside from the, from the path of the juggernaut and let it go rolling past instead of running in front of it constantly. And the damage is that there will be immense damage done, of course, in the process uh, of that. But it's really, I think, when I said before about us reinforcing the system with little actions that we do, it's really is a very much a matter of choosing to do otherwise, uh, choosing, choosing elseness, something else mm. that isn't what we usually do disrupting and rupturing what seems to be normal and doing the abnormal, embracing the monstrous and becoming the impossible. These are the things that we can do because humans are, are, as beings in the cosmos, we have such amazing, almost infinite potential for creativity and transformation. And the lives that we lead now are so small, so diminished by the system we, we're so much more than the systems that we have and once we really truly acknowledge embrace and dwell in that reality and that truth then the systems don't have any power over us anymore yeah and i can i can feel how much there is of nature there as well in our relationship with it and, and how um the, the lives that most of us live are so separate from it. I mean, we yeah. don't, a lot of people don't have direct contact with the food they eat until they have them or have it on the plate. And, and mm -hmm. that, that feedback loop is, is kind of lost. I think I have the sense that nature and, and the food that is being grown needs the feedback from our bodies as well in, 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 in our contact, in, in our shit and our urine and all those chemicals that we're being giving to the we give yeah. to the environment and those those information systems are are, are lost mm. yeah just mm. i lived for many years in in very large cities and and yeah the the so the, the, the idea of bringing people to nature is it's is very important for me um and again, it feels like, oh, how, how do we do with that? With, you know, six million 
7 million, 10 million people living in, in, in a city. And, and there are ways, of course, because you can grow food very locally, even, even, mm. even in massive places. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have been recently in, in knowing more about a, a huge project in Andhra, Andhra Pradesh in India, where through growing local food, the, the way the system works and, and even the hierarchies within between men and women has changed enormously and just by allowing people to be more resilient in, in the way they grow food and then more people start growing food and there's, you know, there, there is that breaking away from, from the big machine, like you say, we just kind of ignore it. So the machine is still yeah. there. They didn't do anything against the big corporations or the government or anything. They just made their own life. Yeah. But yeah. I think you, so what, what, what they were saying as well is that you need the um, critical mass for kind of it to, to, to create that spaciousness. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you do it. All of this uh, this activity needs to be done in community. Mm. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's not an individual pursuit. Uh, we have to do it in communion with others, human mm. and more than human, other life forms. And yeah, that's where the critical mass comes in. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be. A huge number of people you know small communities can thrive in the shadow of the machine uh and that happens and that and they can be really it's about um just yeah it's a bit of a cliche but being the change you want to see in the world is really right. what it's all about and uh then others can see what you're doing and they can be inspired as well and you share you share your gifts with the world and, and, and everyone should be able to do that. Many people are constrained from doing that. Uh, and then we would be all much richer for it if we were able to share our gifts more freely. Yeah. Mm, so, yeah, I, I can, I, it re really resonates. And I, I have the sense that... Um, I mean, change is happening, change is happening all the time, but mm. I, I, I mm. see like the work that you do and like you say, it's not, you're not the only one saying this and, you know, there's this expansion already happening of, of mm. people really telling the truth as well. I mean, truth for me is a bit of a difficult word because it's quite, I feel it's quite relative, but there is also that um, mainstream or, or colonized or, or you know capitalist truths that we are imposed um, or is imposed on us um, and there's there's all this eruption of small large and, and, and kind of coalescing and, and emerging um, alternatives or not even alternatives anymore I really like uh, that idea of the, the ways that we can live in a healthier way. It's not an alternative, but it's normal. And the alternative, the yeah. bizarre thing is capitalism and, and perpetual growth and all that. Um, so in the, yes. with that in mind, um, this project that we have in Rewilding, the, the aim that we started with, or the intention that we started with is to come together somehow in the next year or two, and, and have a gathering that at the moment resembles an assembly. So coming together and, and seeing what are, what are our global problems um, without, without forgetting the local aspect of that. So ideally there would be a lot of links with local um, communities. I am not, so this is, this is kind of our intention and, and, and one thing that I'm taking from this conversation as well is the need for whoever is proposing a strategy to be really aware of the blind spots that we may be bringing so that we don't perpetuate the systems that we are aiming to transform in some way. So with, with, that, with those things in mind, 
are there any global questions that you think would be useful to be asking ourselves as, as a planet? Or, or is it better to forget about that and really just focus on the, on the locality? I don't know if global questions are really that useful. Yeah, I feel like we can get lost in the, in the universalizing tendencies, the abstracting of, of life if we, if we go to zoom out too much, I guess. Mm. So for me, the, the questions that I like to ask are things like, how am I relating to other life around me? Uh, what, what, what am I acting from? What sort of values am I acting from? Not so much principles, but deeper than principles, values. You know, how am I embodying... Uh, care and authenticity, generosity, but also what is it that I desire? What brings me joy? How do I create more potential for epiphany in my life? Epiphanies are so important to help us uncover, to shine uh, light on new ways of becoming. So it's really, it is a very much a, a resonating with, a tuning to and deepening our relationship with ourselves and everything that's beyond ourselves and in the process trying to dissolve those hard boundaries between us and everything else, you know, the inner, making the inside the outside and the outside the inside. Mm -hmm. What is it that your uh, heart yearns for? What is it that your soul is called to? Um, what are the, where are the chains that are, are shackling your heart, you know? Um, what have you created a kind of prison and your soul's trapped in that prison? What, how can you, how can you become more alive in the world? What makes you come alive? Don't worry about what the world needs. Just worry about what makes you become alive. Mm. By worry, I mean reflect on that, feel into that. And when you find out what makes you become more alive, do more of that. Mm. I'm very much into the idea that we humans are naturally very social, very caring and, and this, this Hobbesian sense that we are, are dangerous to ourselves and we need to be controlled by authorities is just completely not true, mm. in my view. It's not truth. Mm. So we need to get in touch with our deeper natures and act from those natures. And when we do that, the world becomes a better place. Mm. So it's not very global. Any of those things are not very global. Yeah. They sound even personal. A lot of it. I mean, you, I, I think in, I need community to, to actually realize those things. But it's, mm -hmm. a, it's kind of an inner, personal, individual work, a lot of it as well. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, that can very much be done. It can very much be done in community. I think community, one of the things about community is that, that I have found is that community is a mirror to ourselves. It holds a mirror to ourselves. It helps us to find ourselves and to um, become more ourselves. So, yeah, it's not, it's not entirely. It's a, it's a kind of, a, yeah, like I said, it's a tuning in and it's a tuning out and it's a dissolving of the in-out boundary and the inside-outside boundary in many ways that, that you know, that, that connects us to the local and then from there to the network of locals and, and the global. You know, it's kind of... A, Think global and act local. That slogan is is really quite uh, important. I think mm. uh, we think global. You know, think of the six mass extinction. We think of the um, climate emergency, but we act locally. Yeah, in our sphere of influence, mm. which starts with our our own uh, 
feelings and desires and our own sense of what happens inside ourselves mm. and then moves out from there, ripples back and forth and resonates and vibrates with everything else. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I guess then what I would like to do, um, not as an individual, of course, but just sit, hoping or, or inviting ways where, where the inequalities that are now, a lot of them being part of how, for instance, the UK where I live or, or, or a lot of Europe, how we extract value from other places and how we bring conflict or the consequence of what, what we do there, um, bring a lot of conflict that I have the sense, of course, I'm, I'm seeing it from a very distant place, that there are many places in the world at the moment where we are not giving people time to to actually do that um mm. so perhaps the 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 emphasis should be more on on really what that the people in the uk for instance where it's where i am or, or you know the, the other places that have such a strong influence in the rest of the world we have the urgency of doing that work very quickly before we finish everybody else and also perhaps um somehow slowing the the personal or or the, the, the impact on people um mm. in the shape of you know taking away the resources so that people don't have enough food or or, or don't have access to land and and all that so that they yeah. can actually have the time to to find that um yeah yeah yeah, time is our, from a, I guess from a capitalist perspective, time is our greatest resource. Mm. But from a, a different perspective, we are we are part of time. Time is part of us and time is rhythmic and cyclical and circular and triangular. It's not linear. and and uh, But we're out of touch with it because all we know is clock time. So that's one of the other things we need to get back in touch with mm -hmm. is the complex textured, textured feel of time. Your time is something organic, something alive, something like the breathing of the universe. And uh, of course, that's not that's what, not what capitalism wants. It wants us to dissect time into little bits that can be um, connected to digits on a clock. Mm. And uh, yeah. People don't have time, but they also don't relate well to time. And that's why they aren't aren't good at doing this sort of processing, metabolizing, digesting work of of transformation mm. of metamorphosis into something other than a a trapped captive of the colonial systems. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, is, is there anything you would still like kind of coming towards the end of the conversation, interview, uh, interchange? Uh, is there anything you feel that you would like to say right now? Mm. I, I would just like to say that I, I I feel like you. I feel there is a kind of a change in the air. You know, it's not uh, not necessarily created by us. It's the world is a complex, emergent, chaotic system, and we're not in charge of it, and we never have been. Although we we think we have been at times. So, but transformation is is can feel transformation uh, growing, which is wonderful. Yeah, I think that the time has come for a, a different age and we have a chance to move beyond kind of take it for grantedness, this, uh, 
these social systems which want us to be quiet, to be hushed, to shut down, to be ashamed, to be terrified uh, of the abundance of the world, the abundance of ourselves in the world and the world in ourselves. And it's really just a beautiful time and place and space time to be inhabiting at the moment. And I invite everyone who's listening to experience that magnificent, generous, abundant beauty of the world. Thank you. Mm, so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you.